Put the volume up. There we go. All right, we're all set here, and uh, I can't wait to share the Word of God with you. I have, uh, I've been preaching and teaching in some form or other for over 40 years, and I still get so excited and so thankful at the opportunity that God gives me to share His Word, and I'm going to be like that the rest of my life. The greatest part in my life is to know Him, to walk with Him, and to discharge the duty, the calling that He put upon me. And central to that is preaching and teaching the Word of God. So I want to thank the Lord for all of you, and I want to thank God for the Holy Spirit who spoke to me this week and put in my heart these, uh, these thoughts uh, and this topic in particular. When you've studied and read and done what I do, and I continue to study and read, and I'm always amazed at kind of as a, the more you learn, the more you realize how little you know. Um, so never think you know that much. But having done it all these years, it's not so much about getting a whole lot of information together as it is hearing what heaven is saying to us and bringing that to you in the most anointed and biblical way that I can. So this week, here we go, mini-series, it's called The Other Big Three. Of course, the main big three, the big, big three that you will know about uh, are faith, hope, and love out of 1 Corinthians 13. And that's an entire topic. It's a whole Bible college syllabus by itself. But there's another big three I want to talk about, and that is these three, money, sex, and communication. Now, uh, Larry and I were talking this week because we're reviewing our last relationships seminar that we did with a couple of dozen people a few weeks back, and we're launching a new one. We're going to do a, a, a second one on that same uh, broad topic of relationships. And uh, this is one of the themes that we discussed uh, as we prepare for that. That's going to be, I think it's, a, it's the first Saturday in July. I think it might be the 3rd of July. Um, but it's the first Saturday in July. So if you haven't booked that in, book that in and be there. That's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, But I wanted to kind of not preempt that, but I really felt touched actually by the Lord to speak about this in this context now on Sunday, which is going to be a different situation, but it will, I think, help both Larry and I as we uh, bring and prepare stuff that we're going to uh, say on a more intimate and uh, personal level. Part one is money. Money, money, sex, and communication are three of the biggest things in life. And the idea that there is a Christianity that is not intimately involved in how you live your daily life and the things that matter is a, is a nonsense. Uh, Charles Finney, one of my favorite preachers from the 1800s, said it this way. He was famed for his great, strong preaching of the gospel. And he said, any preaching that does not have practical application is not preaching the gospel. I remember uh, if, uh, as I was the pr uh, principal of a Bible college in the 90s in Australia, and I had made a commitment to study and learn from some of the great Bible teachers that have been around in the last 50 to 100 years. Uh, at that time, I was in my 30s. So I was, uh, and I traveled around the world, visited various different places, Oral Roberts University, uh, and Rama Bible Training Center in Oklahoma, what was Ulf Ekman's Bible Training, which was having a lot of uh, influence at that time coming out of Sweden, um, the work of, uh, of KT and, and those guys here in England. And so we traveled a lot, made a lot of uh, contacts and also sought to learn. And I've always sought to learn. And I remember it was one great Bible teacher who was actually quoting another. And I don't remember who it was. But he said, you know, I've been doing this for, I think he had been a, a Bible college principal and lecturer for 60 years. And he said, in all these 60 years, I've found that about 90% of what we teach is effectively unusable. And I thought exactly the same as this guy uh, uh, 
said, which I learned from him really. He said, he said, so for goodness sake, we ought to focus on the 10%. And that's what we're trying to do. And so today we're talking about money and I want to just talk through a few issues and matters that are going to help you tremendously. Now, this is uh, maybe the culmination of a whole series of little thoughts that I've been doing. So this is actually the, the 11th one. I've done 10 little thoughts, including a testimony, which started back in September of last year. Because I really felt like we need some kind of input other than what might be typically Christian in terms of tithes and offerings and basically encouraging people to give and give as much as they can and all that kind of thing. I've been around that a long time, but I don't really want to, and I don't think we should present things that way. So today we're giving our time to this area. And as I mentioned, uh, money, sex and communication. So over the next couple of weeks, sex and communication will be our topics. That's going to be a lot of fun. But let's hook straight into the Word of God and make a lot of couple of observations <coughs> that we need. Um, I don't want to rehash all those other 10 points. I'll put something together at some point for us all uh, and try and get it out on the web and help some people. But here's the important things. Number one, you need to know that the Bible talks more about money than probably any other one thing. And that Jesus, no question, no question, taught more about finances than he did about any other single topic. So if Jesus Christ comes to earth and talks about money more than anything else, then, and we're trying to not only be like him, but encourage others to know him and walk with him, then if we're not addressing that topic, then we are missing it somewhere. And, uh, and, and when I say addressing that topic, I don't mean the simple and common encouragement, which maybe many of you, you won't have had that from me for, for years, but many of you may have experienced over the years and certainly was what I was brought up on and what I uh, held to for a long time. The basic opportunity, you know, every, every Sunday mornings, the, the leader would think, you know, well, we need to encourage people to give. We need to remind them that they should tithe. We need to encourage them to be generous and, and that kind of thing. And there's just a lot more to it. That was not the sole heart of Jesus' teaching at all. And uh, we need to reflect his. So the issue that we speak about money and sex and communication is crucial. It's got to, Christianity has got to impact your practical life. So Jesus speaks more about money than anything else. Number two, Paul, the apostle, spoke a lot about money. And, and uses so the New Testament letters do. In fact, there's a slab of two chapters that we will make some reference to later that talk specifically about receiving an offering for those in need and all the things around money. That's all he's talking about for two chapters, and it's interspersed elsewhere. So we need to understand that that's crucial. Now I'm going to just pull... Uh, one bit out of what Jesus taught today to help you, and that's in Matthew 6. You can turn there if you want to, um, but you don't have to. I'm just reading from verse 19 to verse 21. And uh, here's Jesus. This is in what's called the Sermon on the Mount. And here he goes. This is what he's saying. Do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth, where moths and vermin destroy it, and where thieves can break in and steal it. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin don't destroy it, and where thieves do not break in and steal it. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, we could spend the whole day on that, which is not our purpose today. But let me make a couple of simple comments. When he says, do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth, but store it, he's not saying, don't save money. He's not saying it's wrong to do that. What he's saying is that it's a far wiser use of your finances to invest in heaven rather than invest in earth. Your treasure, what you collect, what you save. You can invest it on earth. Nobody's saying that's a wrong thing to do. Jesus is saying you're smarter and wiser to invest it 
in heaven. So as much as this earth that has banking procedures, the ability to invest, the ability to save, calculation of interest, etc., etc., heaven is certainly not behind earth in any way. And heaven sees all your transactions, whatever you give to God, don't give to God, how, what the heart was that you gave it in, and what you choose to do with your money. Now, you are free to choose. But Jesus' advice is interesting. Here on earth, you know, you could invest in things that get damaged over time. Uh, or, you know, mo like moth and rust, they can be destroyed if you're buying natural things. You might have, you might get insurance, but certain, you know, things that you've invested in can be lost. Again, thieves can break in and steal things. Now, heaven is a place where you can invest, but you don't have those problems. So that's Jesus' advice. Be smart and let heavenly investment be your priority. And then the last little phrase he makes, he says here is really helpful too. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Now, that is one of the, the kind of golden rules of life. Wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And wherever your finances flow, the riches of your finances. So whether you're making 12000 a year, you know, 40000 a year or 250000 a year, whether your savings are minus 5000 on a card or $1.5 in a few properties in the bank and some stocks and shares, whatever the situation is, where you've put your treasure tells us tells God where your heart is. And that has application to relationships. If you treasure the other person, then your finances will go there. If you're a man and every time your spouse or partner or wife, whatever, sees a new dress that she likes and it's 295 pounds, which you think is a lot for a dress, and she's been asking for it for a couple of years. And in that time, because you love sports, you've bought yourself some uh, rugby tops that you like that have added up to more than 295 pounds. And then you've also bought yourself a new set of golf clubs because you work hard and you deserve it and you love golf. And they were over a thousand pounds. Then where your treasure went shows where your heart is. Your heart is more interested in taking care of you and taking care of your partner. That's not to put you down. That's just really to help you look at your life wisely. Yes, you should be able to enjoy good things. But where your heart really is, is where it is seen by where you put your treasure. And you could say the same thing about heaven and earth. If your heart is more with God in heaven, then automatically you will tend to cause your treasures to flow that way. If your heart is more concerned about earthly things, if you're more concerned about the house that you live in on earth than the house that you're going to get, get in heaven, then I want to encourage you to change your thinking because this is a very temporal situation down here. And thieves do break in and steal and wrath, moths and rust and other stuff get in. But you're going to get a house in heaven, and houses in heaven will vary. Some will be magnificent mansions, and some will not, because it'll depend on how you invested or used your time, your energy, your prayers, and your finances whilst you were here on this earth. So where your treasure is, there's your heart. That's just a little thought from Jesus. I'm going to move forward because I want to get to a couple of key points and then wrap us up without going too long. We've had a quite a sharp service this morning so far, so that's really good. Okay, one of the things that Paul tells us in the in the Bible, and I'll read it again for you, it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And so he's writing, and even though it's not specifically about finance, it has application to finance. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse about 7, I think it is, he'll say this. Uh, brothers and sisters, I've applied these things to myself. Da, 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 da. Verse 7, listen to this. For what makes you different from anybody else? And what do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you didn't? 
So he's talking to these young Christians in Corinth, and their attitude and their perspective is still more worldly than it is heavenly, and he's trying to help them grow. Because they are thinking that because they have a gift to make money, that's putting it into today's context, or because they have an ability to preach, or because they have a gift, prophetic gift, and they're able to see things in people's lives, that they are somehow superior or more important to others. When what Paul says is, hang on a minute, what you haven't realized is everything you've got, God gave you. Do you have the ability to make money? Some people do. God gave it to you. Do you have the ability to really make people feel special? God gave it to you. You can work with what you have to maximize what you have. But when you understand that every single good thing in your life and gift in your life came from God, it changes the way you approach life completely. And that's the same. Do you have the ability to study well? Are you academically inclined? Are you someone that can go through university and make it work and get all those things? God gave you that ability. Are you a natural business person? And it, you just seem to be able to attract people to you and you and you uh, give them a bit of training and send them out and they do the bulk of the work and you take a percentage off the top and you could have a little business running where you don't do all that much except train the people, but the income is better than any of those other single people. It's kind of a basic small business type mentality. Um, then that... You, you, that, that, that is not of you, that came from God. And when you look at your life, and it's a good thing to do today and this week, and think, okay, what have I got in my life? Am I good at carpentry? Am I good at music? Am I good at singing? Because you've got gifts. Am I good at caring? Am I good at nursing? Am I good at running? Am I good at sports? You know, am I good at whatever? Am I good at cooking? Whatever you've got, God gave it to you. And if you carry that through life like that, that sense, God's entrusted this ability to me, then it changes how you approach. And some of those abilities, no doubt, are the reason that you get paid what you get paid. And the blessing of God, which he wants to pour out on your life, as I mentioned in the very first of this, this kind of 10 series I did before today, the blessing of God uh, is not, it, it isn't equal in the sense that everybody's going to be a millionaire. Some people are going to make millions fairly easily. Every, some people are going to work twice as hard and never get much more than the, the, the basic wage. And so, so the idea of God prospering you is right, but it doesn't work like that. It's not a get-rich-quick scheme. And you have to, if you will approach it that God gave you the gifts. You've got a child? What a gift. What a gift from God. You couldn't do that. You couldn't make that work. And now you've got a job or some resources or some abilities to make money, to pay for the food, to raise the child. I'm telling you, God is incredible. He is so much more in everything about our lives and our worlds than we would ever realize. And it's time for us as believers to realize that and then to display that attitude of thankfulness to God and blessing to all the people that we meet. I want people to be introduced to Jesus by people like us who know him and who shine him instead of who belt people over the head and tell them their sin is going to hell. I don't think that helps. And I don't see that emphasis in Jesus' ministry at all either. But that's a different topic. All right. So, what have you got that wasn't given to you? I'm going to read you one more passage and then we're going to wrap up from there. You're still with me there? I feel like we're touching some good stuff. I just can't. I've got the screen covered, so I can't kind of see everything. 2 Corinthians. If you have a Bible, turn with me to that. That would be good. 2 Corinthians. So I mentioned to you that in one part of the Bible, Paul <clears throat> spends two whole chapters. It's 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. Talking all about an offering, all about finance, all about you guys, basically in this church in Corinth, giving money to another situation. And now you will notice this, that when it comes to tithes and offerings, the New Testament doesn't talk about it all that much. But what it does talk about is generosity. Let me read this 
and then we'll make a few points as we conclude. I hope you're paying attention because this is going to revolutionize your financial world. Here comes Paul writing to this Corinthian church. This is his third or probably fourth letter to them. This is a couple of years after the first one or a year and a half maybe after the first one we just read. And I'm just going to read the opening part of chapter 8. A couple of little bits for you. So stay with me and if you've got a Bible, follow me. You can see it in, in black and white right in front of you. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave, talking finance, as much as they were able to give and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, they urged, urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. That's the opening passage to this chapter. The grace that God has given them, the grace or the anointing of God that caused them to be super generous in the midst of difficulty. That's a great thing. That's what the grace of God does. If you're tight, if you hold your five pound note so tight that the queen gets tears in her eyes, then you haven't got much of the grace of God on you in that area. The more of the oil of heaven flows into your life, the more you want to give in every situation. And I am so thankful that that's something God has done in my life. And when I, I, I get several different, different income sources uh, in my life, because I do funerals, uh, I do uh, lead this church, uh, and then I sometimes will visit and preach and minister to other people uh, and other situations. And so I've, I've got to manage all that income and, and balance it and so forth. And, and what I do, and this is just me, and it's been me for years, I just, I can't wait to tithe. Before we get to the end of the month, so I'll always make sure, for me personally, I always make sure the tithe is in the end of that month because I want the first and the best going to God. And I get uh, some salary sometimes like, like during the month. And then sometimes if I do, for instance, 10 different funerals in a month, then they'll pay me what they pay me. I don't know whether all that money has come in yet or not because some of it's by back, some of it's checks. But I just calculate what I know came in that month and I take a tithe of that and I always add, I call it tithe plus. I've done that for, I don't know, 20 years or more. Always add something to it. I don't want to be like, you know, well, it was uh, 275 pounds. That's just me. If it's 275, tithe plus will probably go up to 350. Then I'll think about helping Pakistan. Then I'll think about helping families in Pakistan. Then I'll look at other situations that I can bless people that I know personally that I can help. Then I'll look at ministries uh, and others that have been a part of my life, even if it's even if I've not met them, but online in some form they've added to my life and I'll make sure I'm doing that. And I, I kind of work, but the point is I'm so excited to give. And uh, and I, I write, I've got my little tithe book and I write it all up and calculate it all in the tithe plus and the whole thing. And I just want to give it as soon as I possibly can. Um, I just wait, so I, I just love it. I'm just so excited. I'm excited about tithing. It's awesome. And that's the grace of God that's on my life. That's just because I wasn't always like that. Just fantastic. So he urges them to do that and have that welled up in rich generosity. Now, then I'm going to read a little passage in the middle of that, verse 13, that kind of adds to the thought Paul's carrying here. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed. What they're doing here in this case is the church in Jerusalem is under some financial pressure. We don't exactly know what that is, but we're trusting Paul, who's an apostle to these guys, to the Corinthians. Not He's not to the, he's recognized as an apostle by the Jerusalem church, but he isn't an apostle there. Uh, the apostle there is James, Jesus's brother. And um, half brother, probably more correctly. And, uh, so he says, he's writing them and he says, listen, guys, our desire is not that others are relieved while you're hard pressed. That's not the intention, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty, because you've got enough, will supply what they need. And in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. 
the goal is equality. In other words, there's a couple of things we can write, we can read in here. One is that the sense of relationship between the churches and other Christians was very strong. That's something I'm trying to champion to get people, uh, churches to be less parochial and less this is my brand and more willing to embrace gifts and uh, ministries and finances from the kingdom that are different from um, from other uh, from, from their brand of church or whatever that might be, that they open their doors to that. That's part of the maturity that we need and that we see Paul endorsing here. The other thing is that it's not, it's, it's the idea is a quality. So that feeds into the thought of percentage being more useful than amount. You know, if your salary is 20,000 a year and somebody else is earning a quarter of a million a year, um, it doesn't make a lot of sense that if they're both tithing, for, for the 20,000 person, I would always encourage you to give something beyond your tithe, but it may well be tight to do that. The tithe biblically is something that belongs to God, and it's an honor towards God, and I've taught about that recently, so I'm not going to go into that. Um, but then the person who's ordering, earning a quarter of a million should realize God has gifted me to earn much more than average. And for me, just to tithe that and maybe give a couple of hundred extra here or there and have what would be a very significant amount of money building up in my own account might not be the best use of the finances and the gift that God has given me. And that plays into that thought of the, of the parables, the parable of the talents that Jesus taught about. You all remember that? The talent was a significant amount of money anywhere from maybe 100,000 to a million. You know, if you research it, a ballpark figure of about half a million pounds for a talent uh, is pretty close. It's not going to be far off that. Uh, different different websites and different studiers say different things, but it's in the hundreds of thousands of pounds. And God gave Jesus, he uses his story, he gave this guy 100,000, this guy 500,000, and this guy a million, if you're going to call a talent 100,000, which is low. So, but they're significant amounts of money. And then what they did with that is how God rewarded them. And the guy who had 100,000, the one talent, whatever it is, buried it, didn't lose it, didn't throw it away, but didn't work with it, didn't utilize it, didn't invest it, didn't use it wisely, and got rebuked by God. The guy who got the five, well, some people are just going to have five. And if you got five and you didn't get 10, that doesn't make the 10 guy better, richer, more important. Well, it does make him richer. Uh, it doesn't make him more important. It doesn't mean that his opinion is more valued within the life of church leadership. Um, it's just that's what his gift is. And he's got to max out what he's got, just like the guy with 500 or a guy arguably with 300 should max out the gift they've got. And that whole principle of faithfulness with what God has given you and recognizing that he is the one behind the blessing that you've got. I just thought I'd throw that in for nothing for you. So it is the goal is equality. Now let me read you here 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and this is the second half and I'm, I'm going to read not all of this but stay with me as we read through this because you'll catch Paul's heart in giving. There's no need, he says, for me to write to you about this service to the Lord's people. So you're serving God's people. I know your eagerness to help. I've been boasting about it to Macedonia. Now, Macedonia was the place that's Philippi that he was referring to earlier, how they'd been so generous in the midst of their difficulty. And he says, I've been boasting to them about you, which kind of subtly put some pressure on the Corinthians. But his heart, you can... See Paul's heart through his writing. Let me keep going. I know your eagerness to help. I've been boasting about it to Macedonia, telling them that since last year, you guys in Achaia were ready to give and your enthusiasm has stirred most of them to action. But I'm sending these brothers in uh, order that our boasting about you in this way shouldn't prove hollow or that you may not be ready, as I said you would be, for if Macedonians come with me, and find you not prepared, we, not to say anything about you, would feel ashamed of having been so confident. 
so I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and finish the arrangements for the generous gift you have promised. And then it will be given as a generous gift and not as grudgingly given. So the idea of preparing, the idea of thinking ahead, the idea of being encouraged by the generosity of others is clearly a biblical thing. And then we have this little passage, and I'll, I'll uh, finish reading just here. This, uh, the whole thing is great, but now remember this, Paul says, you guys who are giving. I'm encouraging you to give. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly, not under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that you, in all things and at all times, have all that you need and you will abound in every good work. Let me read that again. God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things and at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. That's God speaking to us about money. And that's what God's able to do. So as much as we are well encouraged to be generous, super abundantly generous, and realize that beyond the tithe, we are now investing. We are sowing seeds and we're going to reap a harvest. And normally there's some time between the seed sown and the harvest coming. And for some of our giving, the seed will be sown on this side of eternity and the harvest will come on the other side. And for some, it won't, it'll come earlier than that. But the point is that you will sow in accordance, you will reap in accordance with how much you sow, just like a farmer understands that. And so let me make a couple of points as we close here today. That's the biblical model of giving. Let me give you a couple of practical tips and we close. Number one, when you're in a situation, and I've been in these, and, and I'm being honest with you now, I'm not happy with uh, myself as a minister if I find myself saying we're raising funds for so-and-so, or we've put on this conference for you, we have a budget, the budget hasn't been met, so we need to meet that budget, give. Or, as one minister I know, who I met as well, a uh, well-known guy, but it doesn't matter who it is, who would say, receive his own offerings and say, now, ask God to give you a number while you're praying, right? You got that number to give, right? Now, add a zero at the end. And it's kind of funny, but it's also kind of cheeky. All these things that have some level of Manipulation is a strong word, but there's a little coercion in there to give, to stretch you. I want to stretch you, but never uh, against your own personal will. And we've that's been a strong part of my life for many years now. And I know enough to know that not every minister approaches things that way, but everybody I train and help will, because it's a better way to do it. As soon as we put pressure on people to make them feel like they should or, or you know, so-and-so is giving half a million, what can you do? And all that kind of stuff. This is the way you've got to look at it. It's an opportunity to sow. So whether we talk about me flying to Pakistan, the work in Pakistan, if we buy a building here, if we buy a building in Pakistan, if we decide to uh, plant a new church that needs some funding in Wales or Scotland or France, if we decide to start a Bible college and we need the funds to kick this off because we've got a way to train a lot of people and help a lot of people, whatever it might be, uh, all of those things are opportunities for you to invest what God has entrusted to you. Now, the tithe is a different thing because, as I've taught before, that belongs to God. That is not rooted in the law. That's rooted in faith in Abraham. And he got the victory. And the first thing he did with all that God gave him was gave a tenth back to God or God's representative to him, actually, in that case, which was Melchizedek. And Malachi, talking about that, reflects the same thing. When God was talking to his Old Testament people and said, you guys, you, you, there's problems with your life financially. 
because you're under this curse, because you've robbed God. This is God speaking. You robbed me. And then he said, the Malachi, the prophet, how have we robbed you? And God said, in tithes and offerings. You took, now to rob someone, you're taking from them what belongs to them. That's the important thing with the tithe. The first tenth, spiritually, it's just a spiritual truth. It's not the law. It's what Abraham understood before the law. Every good thing in your life, your brain, your tongue, your sunshine, your soil, your lawnmower, your food, every good thing is a gift from God. And one day, I, I pray that you see that whilst we're still on earth. But when you get to heaven, you're going to see it in a way you've never seen it before. And you think, oh my God, every single good thing really did come from him. And some of us might be thinking, why didn't I see that before? I'm doing what I can to cooperate with Holy Spirit to help you see that before so that you can make good choices with your finance. And, uh, and so the tithe belongs to God. That's his. Don't take what belongs to him. But 90% is a pretty good amount. And then you can choose to do what you want with that. So don't, I, I, I don't like to coerce people at all with fundraising and take a number and add zero. The other thing is many preachers will tell you, um, you know, we're going to give to this fund, to Pakistan, to whatever it might be. We're going to build, you know, a new church Bible college here in England. Uh, we need this much money. Uh, and um, people will say, you know, find out, see what the number that God gives you. God will give you an amount. And pray about it and ask God. Now, listen, be, listen let me be honest with you. 90% of the time, that's just rubbish. 90% of the time, it doesn't work that way. And there's a few reasons why. But the first reason is that God wants you to give gladly from your own heart. The treasure, where your treasure is, is where your heart is. If you give under obligation, somebody said we need 10,000, can we scrape 10,000 together for, to help the church or the preaching of the gospel or whatever it might be. If you give under, under obligation, you're not giving in the best way at all. And, and if you if you feel like, well, God gave me this figure, 10,000, I don't know how I'm going to do it. Mostly it doesn't work like that. Mostly you choose. Now, there are some times when God will tell you that. But even in the New Testament, where we have generosity way beyond the tithe, and the, the apostles are preaching, the church is growing, and people are selling their homes and bringing the money and giving it to the apostles, laying it at their feet. Barnabas is one of the people that did that. And there's a number of them that have done that and said, you use this finance in whatever way you need to see this kingdom go forward. They realized in the heat of this revival that earthly treasures were not nearly worth comparing to heavenly treasures. Now, nobody here is telling you you should sell your house. And you'll notice that none of those people in that record that we have said God told us to sell our house. They chose to. And that's nearly always what it is. You choose to give. I would encourage you simply by saying, the more you sow, the more you will reap from the heavenly side of things. But you get to choose. And 90% of the time, that's what it is. And the final point I want to make is in every area of your life, relationships, your spiritual life with God, your mental and physical health, and your finances, always grow in your heart. Always look to become bigger in your heart. Encourage yourself to be generous. Always give with faith. That's why I've given you these verses today, because I know Christians that have been Christians for 20, 30 years. Their tithe comes out automatically at the beginning of the month or the end of the month or whatever it is. And that's fine. It's actually pretty helpful to do it that way. But, but it's become a religious habit that's detached from any meaningful faith. They don't get all excited and say, here we go, we're giving this amount and we're and I'm so excited about it and I'm giving this much extra to, to whatever this month and, uh, and, and I'm looking for God. Keep your faith active in your giving. Always do that. And finally, always keep in mind, look at earth's circumstances from heaven's standpoint. In other words, heaven's resources and heaven's blessing 
are far better and bigger than Earth's. You are on Earth for a short time. Make sure you use that well and train yourself to live with your view on the heavenly reward. Because many that are first will be last. And many that are last will be first. The people that we thought were first on earth because they drove fast cars, had fancy houses and they were Christians and they made lots of money and I'm not against you having a lot of money. It's what's got your heart. The people that we thought were really important in church leadership meetings and making decisions about finance. Not all, but many of those will be at towards the end. And many of those that we consider last, the little lady that's working two jobs, cleaning, bringing up her kids by herself, does cleaning 40 hours a week, then does a little bit of part-time dog walking to make the ends meet, make sure she faithfully ties, has never accomplished much, particularly financially, but her generosity towards God and towards people has been its outstanding. Many of those that we don't see, and maybe she's praying quietly for the pastor and the leader who needs it, but many of those we don't see, many of those will be first in heaven. They'll be in these. I'm not, I'm not extolling not having a lot of money, by the way. I'm just saying, whatever your situation, shine for God in that situation because that is what will be rewarded in heaven. That's part one of the other big three. Can't wait to be with you over the next couple of weeks and thank you for your time sharing with me in the Word of God today. Really love you guys. Really appreciate uh, your time. And I trust that's helped you. We've recorded that as well and we're going to put together a series on finance. I think there's a lot of stuff out there that Christians really need to understand well. To stop being coerced, to stop being told God will give you a figure. And to just take responsibility and say, this is what I chose to do with my life. This is what I chose to do with my finances. God sees that choice and he rewards that choice. Go and live for God. Bless you guys. Okay, I am going to repeat the news desk for those of you that missed my language, my friend's language interpretation for you earlier. So the news desk is coming now. And then after that, we're going to go straight to a nice little worship song. Um, the words aren't there. But they're beautiful words. It's called His Name is Wonderful. And I put a little video clip together with it. And it's just something to worship Jesus with as we go. After that, we'll meet for a chat. And for those that want to join us, a link will have been sent out by Carrie, and I'll see you there. Otherwise, have a brilliant week. Zoom prayer Monday, Tuesday, Thursday. Don't forget that. And uh, we might actually play the trailer at the end. So Monday, 10.30, Tuesday, 6.30. Thursday 6.30. Go Deeper is back this week. It's going to be awesome. I'm having a wonderful time in the Word of God. I just really am. So I'm not sure what we're going to... I've got a few things running in my heart, but that's Wednesday night at 6.30. And then next Sunday, back here, 10.30 in the morning, 5 p.m. alive at Wendover Road. God bless you. Enjoy the news desk. Enjoy the worship. And see you soon. Rounds <laughs> 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 <laughs>
His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Rock of all 